I have to confess to you, parents, that this is probably one of the hardest areas of parenting, praying for purity in your children's lives, because it seems like there, there's nothing that's more attacked by our culture. In fact, there, there is nothing that more shows the character of the age we live in, where it says, be not conformed to the world, than this whole realm of sanctified living in everyday life. Now, now we can all kind of act pure here at church, right? And in Sunday school and at church events, but, but what about tomorrow at work and what about with our neighbors and what about every day in our lives in in normal life well this is the most difficult area for us to pray about purity of heart the scriptures tell us and if you want to turn with me to first timothy 2 we're going to look at verse 9 because purity of heart is usually reflected listen by modesty of life did you catch that Purity of heart is reflected in modesty of life. You say, what do you mean by that? Well, uh, 1 Peter 2 and verse 9, we, we touched on this last week. Uh, verse 8 says the men, you know, he isn't just picking on uh, uh, any one group in the church. Verse 8, he says, I want you to have holy hands. He said, I want your whole life to be encompassed by holiness. But look at verse 9. He applies it. Verse 9, he says, in like manner also. He said, I want to apply this to everyone. And he says, if you're going to have holiness in your life when you lift hands before the Lord, the women should adorn themselves in modest apparel. Now, now listen to what I'm saying. Modesty of life reflects purity of heart. The, the holy hands lifted in prayer in verse 8 is, is fleshed out. That's a bad word, flesh, because fleshly is bad, but is lived out. In modesty of life. Well, how is modesty most often reflected? Did you ever think of that? You know, let's not be ethereal. Remember, we're talking about how to pray for our children. You want to do this, sit with them. Read the Bible to them and have them look at you and say, "Uh uh-huh, and what does that mean? See, that's where the Bible gets applied. It's applied around the the table. It's applied around the, the, the time when your family meets at the Word of God. And by the way, I strongly recommend that you find a time if you have a family where you all are sitting together. We find it best to have it at meals. And tell you what, you want to slow down a meal? Read the Bible. You know, American family is, I call it the aircraft family model. Family members, especially children, just do touch and goes. They just come by and grab and gulp and run. That's not how the Bible talks about the family. It says when you sit at your meals, when you walk in the way, when you rise up, when you go to bed, you talk about God. And so this kind of lifestyle where you fill with the word of God and you say you apply this. I mean, when, when we read, we're not quite this far, but we've talked about it. But when we read this, how would you apply verse 9 to your family? How do you apply adorn yourself in modest apparel, that, that holiness of life shows up in modesty in life? What area would you touch on? Well, that's what we're going to look at this morning because modesty is most often reflected in our clothing. And when we pray for purity in our children, it involves their minds, but it also involves their clothing. And if you pray for purity in your children, you pray for godliness in mind, but also godliness in body because the mind is inside the body and the body reflects what the mind is doing. Well, where are we? On the back of your sheets. We saw last time that we should be praying as a lifestyle. We should be praying for reality in the spiritual lives of our children, for them to be genuinely saved and loving God's word and living in victory, that they should be thinking of heaven uh, and they should find sin repulsive and, and stay tender toward God. That's where we start. But we don't just pray for spiritual reality in their lives. We pray that in their, their inner lives, their personal lives, that they have integrity. And what, what is integrity in their personal life? Well, we said it's maintaining a clear conscience. What's a clear conscience? It's having a mind that is framed by the word of God, that, that our responses, our directions of life, our values, our ethics, our morals, our conscience is surrounded and fed and bounded by the word of God. So we covered that a couple weeks ago. Last week we looked at learning to stand alone. That's personal integrity. What that means is a lack of hypocrisy. I'm the same way when I'm on a business trip as I am as when I'm on vacation, as I am when I'm sitting in wherever pew I sit in church, as I am at work or at school or in my neighborhood. I am the same. I stand up even without the crowd for the Lord. Third point, personal integrity 
means seeing them, that's our children, seeking to stay pure. Now, the Bible talks much about purity, especially when it involves the moral realm. And I'm not going to talk about the private things that you should address as parents with your children. You should address those in private. The Bible very clearly says fathers and mothers sit with their children and explain things to them. I'm going to talk more about public life. Everything I'm going to talk about today is public. What do you publicly display in your life? What do you publicly reflect here this morning and where you're going to be the rest of this week if the Lord gives it to us and where you were last week? Okay, so how do we do that? Well, look at Genesis 39. This is the first verse we looked at. Genesis 39, and I just alluded to this last week. It starts with realizing that anything we do, anywhere, God is watching. And Genesis 39.9 talks about a God consciousness. That God sees over my shoulder. God sees into my heart. God looks through the eyes that, that I see out. And he is watching. And so look what Joseph says. This is that climactic moment when Joseph said, there's no one greater in this house. He's talking to Potiphar's wife. Uh, Than I, nor has he, that's Potiphar, kept anything back from me but you, that's Potiphar's wife, because you are his wife. How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? She asked him to commit what the Bible describes as adultery. That's a being with someone you're not married to. And so this married woman was, was trying to cause Joseph to be involved in an adulterous event. He introduced something else into the equation. She thought she had him all alone in this Egyptian mansion. And he said, <clears throat> somebody else is in the room with us. God. And I can't sin while he's watching me. And he watches me all the time. What a great thought. How do we pray for our kids? They realize any sin, whether that we're there or not, whether they're away from us or not. God is watching and you don't want to sin against God. How does that apply? Turn over the New Testament book of 1 Thessalonians 4. 1 Thessalonians 4. You go by the Gospels and then Acts, Romans, Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, and there's 1 Thessalonians. Chapter 4. And what Paul writes to these people and the Thessalonians, Thessalonica is still a mighty city. It's still there. Uh, it, we visit it when we travel on, on our Bible study tours in Greece, and, and it's a huge seaport town to this day, massive town. But then it was a center of, of the whole Roman culture which was very, very immodest culture. So what did Paul tell these people who were living in the midst of, of athletics? I mean, you think it's bad enough the way our culture's going. Their culture had already been there. Their athletics were, they didn't wear skin-tight outfits. They wore no outfits. They wrestled, they ran, they did all of their stuff without clothing in the Greek culture. It was, it was absolute immodesty. So what do you do about that? 1 Thessalonians 4, 3. Paul said this. This is the will of God, your sanctification. So that's why we're talking about this. Praying for holiness in everyday life. You should abstain from sexual immorality. Each of you should know how to possess his own vessel, his own body in sanctification. You should know what to do with this body, where to take it, what to do with it, what to put on it, where Christ is reflected. That's what he's telling them. Know how to possess your vessel in sanctification and honor. Not in passion and lust. He says you're not in that scene anymore like the Gentiles who don't know God. So no one should take advantage of and defraud his brother in this manner. So what he's saying is my conduct can cause another brother or sister to be offended. And I want you to start thinking about that. Because where we're going with this is God says... What you do in public can affect the personal life of another believer, as well as lost people, but especially in this verse. He's saying, make sure that what you do uh, doesn't defraud your brother. Because the Lord is the avenger of all such, as we have also forewarned you and testified. Now look at verse 7. God didn't call us to uncleanness, but in holiness. What does the Lord want from us? He wants us to reflect Christ.